here's Johnny. Well gang, I'm back and for this video I'm going to be skinning the white-tailed deer. Probably the most hunted animal on the North American continent. Um, I've gotten many requests. What, pro th th what prompted this was I've gotten many requests uh, to do a video on skinning the whole deer to make available on YouTube. Uh, the other thing that prompted this was when I received a uh, white-tailed deer cape that I had ordered from a seller. Um, beautiful three-and-a-half-year-old eight-pointer from Michigan. Gorgeous winter weather uh, taken uh, mid-November. Mid thick, thick winter, winter hair. And uh, it arrived frozen, as it was supposed to. And as it thawed, I opened up the face, only to my dismay to discover the eyelids were pretty badly cut. The rear edge of the eyelids on one side was sliced, actually kind of a double slice. On the other side, the other eyelid was cut right in half at the back. Um, now I photographed this damage and here's what, here's what I was looking at. Yeah, it's pretty bad. But being in this as long as I have going on 53 years, I started around 1966, I can repair that. You, you should never have to repair that when you buy a cape. You should be able to just flush it down, get it tanned, and start using it. Well, I notified the seller, sent him those photos that you just looked at, and he was appalled. He thought he had done it right. Uh, I told him I was going to be doing a video on uh, skinning white-tailed deer, and he was overjoyed. He uh, really wants to see how it's done. So that's what also prompted me to do this video. Um, the other thing, which is kind of funny, he left the entire upper palate in the, uh, the face of the deer. A good three, three and a half inches were left intact in the skin, uh, which kind of told me that he really doesn't know about skinning the face of the deer properly, the nose. Uh, no big deal. I skinned it out. It's not a problem. Uh, then it also had the long incision. It basically sold me half a deer. And it was open from the middle of the back all the way up to between the ears where it veed off to each antler. Um, he had really no experience with the short Y incision. Now the short Y incision is relatively new in that it came into vogue and into favor around the early to mid 1980s. Uh, when I started back in the 60s there was no short Y incision. We opened up our deer with the long incision all the way up the back to between the ears branched off to each antler. Um, I have since purchased a couple of vintage books on taxidermy, one by William T. Hornaday and the other one by John Rowley. Both um, books are very old. They were originally published in the late 1890s, republished in the early 1900s. And in the, in the book on skinning and on mounting, there is a mention of, the, of a short Y incision used on short-haired deer and on African antelopes. So it ain't new, folks. You know, what's old is new again. So it's, it's not really all that new. It's just, it's what's used now more frequently than, than a, 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 an open incision, a, a flat skin. Uh, now on this little skin, it's not going to be a problem. There's lots of long hair. Sewing it up will be a breeze. 
a long breeze, but a breeze. And once it's tamped down uh, and hammered down flat with the long hair, it's never going to be seen. So I thought, let me make this video using a short incision. Um, and it's going to begin with uh, measuring, the, measuring the deer head using my measurement charts. Uh, my measurement chart is available online uh, from various sources. You can find it on Facebook at the Taxidermy Lab if you request it there. Taxidermy Workshop, I believe. You can also email me personally at john at johnbtaxidermy.com, and I'll be more than happy to email you back a uh, full-resolution scan that you can print out for your own use. Um, I'm going to take you through the, uh, the knives that I use, um, the skinning, skinning process, um, the way I skin it, which is kind of bass backwards anyway, starting with the, uh, at the front of the face, working back, and then opening up the back and working forward. It's me. Uh, then I, I'll also do some basic fleshing of the face one, once, it's, once it's completely skinned. So with all that, uh, sit back, enjoy the show, and uh, I'll see you all on the other side. Uh, one of the things I do before I even start taking measurements, I set the deer up for photographs. And the photographs I take are quite simply, uh, I put the deer head on the floor, and this way I have a, a good visual angle of the antlers to the tip of the nose. And what I do is I put a little eye in the head for photographic purposes. It's the same thing that uh, uh, guides do when they take a hunter and uh, they want to have some game photos taken of the, the kill. You know, uh, this way they don't have that dead eye looking in there. These are the... OTS, Ohio Tax Remy Supply, True Eyes. Uh, I prefer glass in my mounts, but I will put the little plastic eye in the head for uh, photographic purposes. Now, this deer, believe it or not, was taken by a young huntress. And I think she did a pretty good job securing this animal. Anyway, these are the photographs that I take. The materials used for measuring are as follows. My measurement chart. I use three different size calipers. The smaller one is good for the majority of the facial uh, measurements. This longer one here are for, is good for getting measurements that require a little longer calipers, as well as for measuring the length of the ears of the deer. And I'll show how that's done. And the largest calipers of all is used for measuring the entire length of the head, from the tip of the nose to the back of the skull, which you have to find by determining with your feel, with the feel of your fingers, where the point of the back of the skull is. This big one is the only one that makes it. And of course, uh, I have a Stanley tape measure, and I have another ruler that I use as well. But I like the Stanley tape measure because it has multiple, multiple uh, measurement indications. It goes uh, right down to uh, sixteenth of an inch, and those are good. And of course, off to off to one side, the inevitable cup of coffee. It's like my own personal American Express card. I don't leave home without one. 
Let us begin. Okay, to start, I lock my tape measure so that I lock it out. So I got 17, 18, 19 inches. But I lock this out. And I put it on the uh, on the table. I have my measurement chart all ready to go. It's made out with the uh, customer name, invoice, the date it came in, the uh, description of the pose. Uh, this is going to be a hard left turn. Eye sizes, basically 32 millimeters is correct. One of the other things I do before I start skinning, I use these Impresso write-on tags, and this gives me all of the hunter's information, his name, invoice number, the date it was brought in. Now, beginning measuring, I simply take my little old calipers, and I measure front corner of the eye, tip of the nose. Don't squeeze the tip of the nose. You want a good fit, just like so. Put this on the edge of the, on, on the uh, one edge of the tape measure to get my measurement. And what I've got here, I've got a deer hood that measures about seven and a half inches long. Get another one, another measurement, just to double check it. Whoops. That was stupid of me. But off of the course. I'll take the measurement. Like so. Measure off. Seven and a half works. All right. Nose to eye. Seven and a half. And for the form for this, I think I'm going to go with a Joe Combs Classic. He has some really, really nice looking uprights with hard left turns, possibly even offset shoulders, which makes it, makes it even better. Now my number, my number two measurement is the eye to the rear edge, uh, the rear edge of the nostril, like so. Like so, from here to here. Again, I put this to the tape measure. On this, I get six and one eighth. I mark it on the on the measurement chart. Six one eighth inches. Now, I'll put that aside for now. One of the more important set of measurements I take are the antler to tip of the nose. Now even though I already have the nose to eye measurement and I've taken photographs of the deer <coughs> to help with the angle of the uh, antlers visually, because it's a measurement I like to take them. On this little fella here the tip of the left antler to the tip of the nose, 17 and a half. The other side, I get from the tip of the right antler to the tip of the nose. This time I get 17 and 3 eighths. It's almost symmetrical as far as its seating. Now I have an area on the measurement chart for that. The left, and it's L14, left to the tip of the nose, that's number 14 measurement. 17, I'm just gonna check it again. I wrote down 17 and a half, I just wanna be sure. Yes, 17 and a half, very good. Right down to the middle. The other side is 17 and 3 eighths. I simply mark that R14, right 14. 17, 3 eighths. 
Another measurement I take, antlers, tip of the antler, front corner of the eye. On this buck we have 13 and 13 and 5 sixteenths on this side, on the left, 13 and 5 sixteenths. This sounds ridiculous to some, not to me, not to me. Another measurement I take as far as antlers in relationship to the head, and I will do the other side off camera, it doesn't need to be, doesn't need to be repeated again. Another important measurement I like to take, which aids in the setting of the antlers, is from the bottom of the antler burr, actually underneath the antler burr, to the rear corner or rear edge of the eye, like so. And the nice thing about taking all these measurements, eventually, you begin to find patterns in that they are very, very similar. Now this measurement is one and three quarter inches from here to here. I only do that on one side, one, three-quarter inches. I only do that on one side. And I do the ears. To do the ears, they're done a little differently. I note all damages to the ears. This deer has got what looks like a bite out of the upper edge of the ear and he has a notch here in the lower edge of the ear. Measure the ears, I take my calipers, I put them in reverse mode, which I, I simply cross, cross the measuring arms. The first measurement I take is from the highest point where the ear turns on the top, and I take that down to the widest point on the bottom, just in from the edge of the hair on the ear. This gives me a width measurement of two and three quarter inches. And that's marked on my measurement chart as E1L. So that's two three quarter inches. I then take the little longer calipers. Again, cross the streams, no, <laughs> cross the blades till they're re reversed until they become like a scissor action where I can press down and adjust the, the length, or adjust their, their width, I should say, to get the length. And I go into the notch of the ear at the base where the upper and lower part of the ear separates. I take this up to the edge, make sure it's seated in the notch, take it to the edge, then back off to just where the brown, the dark brown hair begins on the tip of the ear. I then take this measurement. This gives me an ear length of six inches. This is now E2L on my chart, E2L. And that is an even six inches. Now just so you know, the left ear does not always match the right ear. Okay, sometimes a deer has got one ear longer than the other. That's all you can do. Um, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to take the length of the head measurement now, and I think this will probably be the last one that I put on camera. For that, I take my large calipers, feel where the back of the skull is, and that is right a little point back here, it's right here. I set the calipers onto the point, go down to the nose. This deer has a head length well over 12 inches. And I put this down to the tape measure. And I find that his head length is, goodness gracious, well over 12. His head length measures 13. And that measurement is number number seven on my chart. 
That's 13 inches. That is a long head. Okay, that is a long head. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll contact the manufacturer, and if I can, I'll speak with the sculptor themselves and find out if they know the measurement on the length of the deer's head. Some guys do, like Joe Combs does. Um, if not, I'll make sure I get a deer with the correct nose to eye measurement. And then I'll have, uh, if I need to, I can lengthen the head. The last measurements to mention of importance are those taken on the front of the face. And these are measurements that are taken through the jaw, through the lower jaw here. I take them on either side of the nostril bulge on the side of the nostril. I also like to record the width of the nostrils. Now remember, you're, you're measuring a dead animal, okay? This is in fact a dead animal, so these are a guideline. Then I will measure the wings of the nostrils. I'll also measure the width of the muzzle behind the nostrils and the width of the nasal area up here. I will then measure between the eyes I will then take a measurement eyeball to eyeball. That's why I leave the artificial eyes in. All right? They will sit in the sockets at pretty close to the correct depth. I'll then take measurements on the rear corners of the eyes. I'll then take measurements of the meat below the eyes and above the eyes. There we go. Another measurement to take is the measurement of the ear butt. And for that, I use... My calipers, I hold the ear in position so I can tell where the ear butt is. I'm at the top of the ear butt to the bottom of the ear butt. That's the height. On that I get two and two and five eighths. And that's number eleven, two and five eighths. inches and then I go from the V notch to the base so I go like this and I get a measurement like so and that measures the length of the earbud and on that I get one and three quarter inches long that's the number 12 measurement one and three quarter inches long I'm going to measure the rest of this deer off camera then we're going to begin. And just as I figured, the right ear measurement differs from the left ear. Um, and that's all recorded. And that's good because that'll, that'll go to the proper fitting of the, uh, the ear liners. Also, on some deer, it looked like they might have a big face, a large face this way. I take some supplemental measurements. And those are taken at various points, what I call through the, through the top and bottom. So it goes from the bridge of the nose to the lower jaw. And on this buck, we have a measurement through here, four and one-eighth inches. A little further back, five and five, uh, four and five-eighths inches. And then back here, crossing just in front of the lacrimal gland, it goes up to five and one-eighth inches. I also measure through the cheek. Remember, this is a dead animal. There's no muscle tone. So you have to take this kind of with a, with a grain of salt. Uh, but this was four and a half inches through his face. The neck measurements will, will come after I get the skin up over the neck meat. I do not measure around the hair. That doesn't make sense because you will get an, an untrue or a false measurement, probably larger than the actual deer. So, and when I, when I take the neck measurement, I use a uh, fiberglass coated cloth tape measure. I do not use, uh, I do not use this steel uh, or aluminum uh, tape measure. So I'm going to get my headlight and I'm going to begin skinning. All right, here I have set up the tools, the knives actually, and the sharpening implements that I use. 
Here's just a big old sharpening steel. This is an old sharpening steel, probably from the 30s or 40s. Still works. We have the, the Edgemaster Pro. This is a real good uh, sharpener for setting the, the edge on a blade. And the sharpening steel is what's used for keeping the edge keen or sharp. Various type knives from J.A. Henkels. We have two of these uh, parry knives. We have uh, the curved edge. We have a straight edge parry knife. We have a bird's beak or curved blade parry knife. I have an older one. It's a little beat up, but I'm still able to keep it sharp enough to work around the bone, around the antlers. This is an old, old, old Henkel's knife. The little marking is even worn off the handle. This um, bit of electric tape around the hilt or the blade of the knife to the hilt is so that it only goes in so far. This is mostly used for cutting lip slots on the head form around the, uh, the area on, located under the nostrils which always get hollowed out. But around here it's good to keep a sharp edge right here on the tip and then work around the, uh, the uh, antler burrs. And the nice thing about having the blade covered with electric tape, you will not cut into the skin as you would if you use a full uncovered or naked blade. But with all these tools in my arsenal and my preferred beverage of choice, coffee, we're going to get started. First thing I'm going to do is glove up. I have some nitrile gloves and I'm going to put them on now. All right, to start, I'm going to go ahead and clean off some of the blood and fluids that are here. Two reasons I do this. I do do this for myself so I can make out where I'm at. I'm also doing this for the camera so you, the viewer, can make out where I'm at. I start my skinning through the front, through the mouth. Peel down a lower lip. Start by cutting across the gum tissue. And I'm, 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 I guess I'm about, oh, half inch or three quarters of an inch back from the actual lip itself is where I start slicing. Okay. Then I go in, I go along the jawbone, and I join up where I separated it at the front. Let me move this around so I can see it as well as the camera. I can't skin it if I can't see it. I go back in, like so. I'm cutting, basically I have the tip of the blade riding along the jawbone. I put a little edge on this, tip of this knife here. Okay, now that should do her. Oh nice, nice. You see how that separates. And I continue to skin down and skin the lower lip away from the bone of the lower jaw. Now I go to the top here like so and I cut along just above the palate, just above the hard palate. I lift the upper lip as I go, lift that up and away, go down in here and start slicing through the lip skin. Now be careful you don't go all the way through. You've got your fingers on the outside and your thumb along the inner lip like so. And you simply go down and you do little short light slicing 
with the knife. Okay, like so. Now, I'm going to repeat what I just did on the other side. If the camera picks it up, great. If not, it's the same thing that you just saw. Okay, so don't panic. I'm doing the same exact thing on this side as you saw me do. Uh, on the left side as you saw me do. On the opposite side. What you do to one side, you repeat to the other. Now is where I start actually skinning the lower jaw away from the, the lower jaw skin away from the lower jaw bone. And I open up the interior lips as I go. Again, keeping the knife blade against the bone. And I just start car uh, carving away at the meat. Just start carving it away like so. You can see, I like to leave meat on the jawbone. Now, right here, I'm contacting the skin. You don't want to go through there. You don't want to go through. I will go like so. Take this down. You don't have to leave all the meat on the bone the way I do. You can leave the meat attached to the skin. If you're more comfortable doing that, so be it. Now right here, I've exposed the skin of the, of the, the underside of the chin. It's, it's right here. I've exposed this right here. I'm going along. I'm, gent I'm gently shearing away the meat. And you want to avoid putting holes in the skin. And you see how we're coming away from the lower jaw right here. Pretty. Now I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to join what I did on the one side, on this side here. I'm going to do the same. Um, again, the knife blade is towards and against the bone. All right? Like so. Just like so. Now let me reposition things for a better view. I'm coming down a lower jaw on the opposite side. I'm going to take it down, just like I did. This is the left side of the animal. I took down the right side. I want the left now to match what I did on the right. I pull, and as I pull, you see the attaching tissue, the fascia that attaches it to the lower jaw. You see that stretching and stretching white. It's like a white knuckle, but it's reversed because you're stretching it. That's what you want to cut. Go all the way down into the mouth like this. Again, cutting along the bone. This is the skin right here. This is the lower jaw skin. I just want to cut along the bone where it's being pulled away from the bone. I don't want to cut through the skin. Okay? Now I go in where I separated the upper lip here, I want to meet, I want it to meet up with the cutting of the lower lip. So I go in with my finger as my guide. I have, I hold on, let me clean this up a little bit. I hold the gum, the interior gum with my thumb. Hold the gum with your thumb. The finger on the outside, my index finger on the outside, and I start cutting across the lip skin and the gums. Gently, not with a lot of pressure. I don't want to go through the skin. I want to detach all of this from the bone. I'm going to come through. Let me reposition again. Again, here we go. Cutting across the gum tissue. Meeting up to where I sliced it into the lower lip area. I want exposing the skin, leaving the red meat attached. I'm 
like so. Just cutting the meat, paring the meat away from the skin. These are paring knives and you can pair with them. Now this is, again, I'm going to keep going through the meat until I expose the, this is the skin of the side of the mouth being exposed. I go up, I do the same thing through the meat on the upper part of the upper side of the mouth. I'm trying to stay away from the scientific names of these areas and these muscles. I don't want to confuse the viewer. You all, I don't want to confuse you all. Okay, I'm going to reposition again, and I'm going to skin up the side of the face to the okay. nose. I pull back on the nose and expose the interior gums. I'm going to slice across the front, like so. Like so. like so. Right now I'm beginning to expose the nostril area. Now for those of you that are not sure where you're at, stick your finger in its nose. Serious. Pick his nose. Stick your finger in his nose. Here's your fingertip right here. Moving around. Cut below that. We just opened the base of the nostril. Like so. I'm going to do it on the other nostril as well. I'll stick my finger in. You see it moving around there? Okay. I want to go below the finger. And here's the fingertip again. Showing here. I now can start going back through the cartilage. Just like that. That's the cartilage of the septum. That's the septum cartilage. Okay, now I'm going to reposition. I'm going to go down the side of the face. Cut to the back of the nostrils. You see how this all begins to fold back and expose the entire interior. Entire interior. Wow. I don't know, sometimes I can't believe the things I say either. I'm sorry. Now, here we go. I'm going to skin around the gums on the side of the face, the interior gums. Now, a lot of people will just open it up from the back and come forward and just tear all this off. You can do that. I have no problem with you doing that. Uh, personally, I like skinning from the front back. Let's me see what I'm getting into before I get into it. Uh -huh. Cutting the back of the nostrils again. Yeah, I'm gonna cut along the back of the nostrils, like so. They're loose. They're loose from the nose now. Now I'm going to cut across this cartilage here of the septum. I want to cut across my finger underneath. Carefully, just cut into the cartilage. Now here, right here, is a gland. There is a gland here. If you cut this low, leave it intact until you flesh. If you cut through it, you'll have this sort of off yellowish, pale yellowish, off white, creamy looking pocket. That's going to be taken away from the skin anyway. Now these are all the tendons that control the upper lip. These are what roll the lip back during the Fleming process when they catch a scent of a, a hot chick, deer. Oh, we could depend on our, our eyes, our brains, and class if we have any. Okay. This front nose cartilage is now detached from the skull. Now we continue to go along, dissect past the meat. 
Now, in here is the gland, right in here. It's, it feels rather spongy. It's right here. That's part of the scent gland, the scent collection, I should say. I'm going to put a little bit of an edge back on my knife. Come down. And I turn the steel as I go. Turn it. Like so, here we go. All right. I want to get through the meat to the skin. Let me reposition things again. Okay. Put my finger under here at the front and start carving this away here. Now my knife blade is turned in the direction of the meat and the skull. I'm not this, if I go this way, I will cut into the skin. <clears throat> if I go this, the opposite of that, I can pare the meat away from the skin as I go. Literally pare it away. It's like flushing it away as I'm skinning. It's being flushed away as I skin. Now you see this connective tissue here, that gets cut free. All right, that gets sliced free. The left side of the face is freed up. Now he's still a little bit frozen in places. He came in frozen solid. I had him in my shop refrigerator for about a week. <clears throat> Left him out overnight. Yesterday our temperatures were in the 50s. Quickly dropped overnight. And it's about 39 degrees right now. Now I'm going to turn him around so I can do the opposite side of the face on camera. But you see where, where we are here right now, we are actually approaching the front of the lacrimal gland here. Okay, we're approaching the front of the lacrimal gland right now. All right. And I really pride myself on, on keeping holes out of the skin. It's a lot different when you're doing it on camera and you really can't see because you want the viewer to watch. But I'm going to turn them okay. around. Okay, put a little edge on the knife again, one more time. Okay. You may notice that this, the balance of the cape is in the plastic bag. That's to just keep things, it helps contain most of the blood that's in there. This is a pretty bloody mess back there. Now here's where I go like so, and you see how it's coming away. Okay, I'm going to go down here. All right, like so. Again, the blade is towards, the edge of the blade is towards the skull. Here we go. Now let me get him like so here. You can still see it, yes, you can still see it. Now I'm going to go under these tendons and just cut them away. Carefully go under them, like so. I'm going to go along, my finger under the skin, I'm going to flush back, I'm going to expose the skin, the hide, like so. I'm going to go down, the lips, the gums rather, and I want to join the lower gums to the upper gums, like I did on the opposite side, like so here. A little slimy. Let's dry that up, get a good grip. All right, and there we go, like so. All right. Like so, yeah. Now this is part of the procedure I do when I'm utilizing the short Y incision. I like to get the face as freed up as I possibly can for skinning the other way. When I start skinning from the back of the head forward. 
I start by skinning from the front of the head backward. Get under this heavy meat. I do now, personally, I do not recommend using a scalpel. Scalpels are harder to control. Scalpels are made for cutting into tissue, cutting into tissue, not for scraping along, not for paring away like I'm doing here. Scalpels were designed for surgery. That's what scalpels were designed for. Yeah, they have plenty of uses in taxidermy. Uh, problem I have with them, I got big old fingers and the last thing I need is for a scalpel blade to slice my finger. Now let's slice from a sharp scalpel is better than a slice from a dull knife, but if I can avoid slicing my fingers at all, that's my first choice. Now you see how we've got this face exposed? We can keep going back and going back and going back and going back. Now I'm going to go all the way back until I reach the front of the lacrimal glands. Like so. We're almost there. Here's, here's the lacrimal gland on the outside. And here we are on the inside. Now I'm going to turn it around and get the, uh, I'm going to catch up to where I am here on the opposite side. I want to catch up to where I'm at. Okay. Now, I'm right at the lacrimal gland, right at the front of the lacrimal gland. Get in here. This goes like so here. And like so here. Around the nasal. Did you see how thick this nasal bone is here? Very, very thick. That's why that measurement was taken. I can match the deer brought in to the form that I choose, and I can make sure it goes out the same dimensions it had when it came in. Just like so. These are the gums on the side of the mouth. Deer kind of looks like he's up there in age, maybe four or five years old. A good sized deer, They're a decent sized rack, but it's a good sized deer. Good body size. Now, I'm going to cut close to the bone here, right into the bone. I'm going to use, in fact, I'm going to use my shortened blade. I'm going to put a little edge on it, get it sharp, and I want to get in here, because I don't, I don't want to cut any skin, but I'm going to get in here. I'll see if I can zoom in on this. All one. right. Pulling away the skin from the skull, this is the cavity of the lacrimal gland. Like so. I need a little sharper part of the blade here. Get this tendon away here in this vein, facial vein. Now I'm going to go into the lacrimal gland. I want to go deep down into it. I'm going to carve into the pit of the lacrimal gland, like so. Can you see it? All right. There we are. Now, I need to lift this vein away from here, this facial vein. Let me get that free. It's really hanging up the process. All right, here we are. Here we go. Now, I hope you can see this. Reposition right. it again. He's got a 
this is a deep, deep detail here. All right, here we go. All right. Okay. Right here, right here is the pocket of the lacrimal gland. This imp impression in the skull is the socket that it holds into, and it's held in place by really strong little tendons, really strong attachments. You can get past it, the battle's half won. Now, because now we're on our way to the front corner of the eye. And that will be skinned from the back forward. But right now, this here has been freed up. Where we're, where we're at now is the front channel of the eye. That adheres very, very tightly. And it'll be much easier we get that from behind. I'm going to repeat what I just did here on the other side. All right, here's where we are now. We've, I've skinned back all the way. Okay. I've actually gone a little further, and I've gone back to the front corner of the eye. But the rest will go from behind. I'm going to turn them around now. I'm going to prepare to make the opening incisions in the head. 